Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to everyone who's come out today. I'm really honored to be here. This is, I think it's, yes, my first live conference back, and I can't think of a better place to get back in the saddle. So there. This is joint work with uh, Christina Gennardi, Eric French, and Rory McGee, who probably a number of you have met. Um, usual disclaimer applies. Okay, so the motivating question is, what drives the retirement savings of singles and couples? And when we're thinking about answering that question among, among the possible explanations we're going to look at, are the quest motives, medical expenditures, and survival risk. Microphone, please, sir. Do you, do you prefer the microphone? <laughs> um, do you prefer the microphone? Where's the remote? Uh, the remote is here. Okay. So, where, where is there a mic in this? I don't know, there's no mic, but he just wants you to talk either in this mic or in this mic. Let me use this mic. Is this better? Okay. Scooby to be do. Um Okay, so yeah, uh, we're looking at sort of the usual suspects as to what 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 drives the saving of elderly households. And we we want to know how these motivations behave, not just uh qualitatively but quantitatively in driving aggregate savings. Okay, so why couples? We, all of us have done, a, or many of us have done a lot of work on the saving of singles. Why couples now? Well, the first answer is there's a lot of couples. There are many, many retirees are members of a couple, and they tend to be richer than saving singles, so they hold a lot of, a lot of aggregate retirement wealth. So if we're going to quantitatively explain patterns in retirement wealth, it's nice to consider What's nice to really explicitly account for the fact that they're married. Um, and perhaps more importantly, couples and singles behave differently in retirement. Singles tend to decumulate assets. Now, it's worth noting this rate of decumulation is much slower than you would get in a, in a simple life cycle model. It's almost flat, but it tends to, the slope tends to be negative when there is a slope. Uh, intact couples, on the other hand, not only are they richer, but they actually tend to maintain or increase their wealth. Also, most elderly singles at some point in their life were part of a couple. And this transition is obviously a big part of the, of the life course. And so if we want to understand where Okay, you know, how a, 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 a widower in a nursing home wound up there, we need to think a little bit about how they were behaving when they were part of a couple. And finally, going back to the big question about what exactly quantitatively is driving the saving of elders, elderly households, you know, as so many of you are familiar with, it appears, you know, that medical expenses, the quest motives, the desire to maintain, stay in your own house, they often have very similar implications. And there's a little mini miniature literature that many in this audience have participated in, trying to find ways, sources of identification that disentangle these different motivations. And we think because couples behave differently from singles and they face slightly different economic environments, that might be another source of identification to bring to the problem. Okay, previous work. What are we bringing relative to previous work? Um, one is that we're going to look at bequests in some detail, and in particular, we're going to distinguish between bequests made when the last member of a household dies and bequests made when the first member of a household dies, when a couple becomes a single. And you might think that that, that, that first First sort of bequest is just obvious. The, the, all the wealth is left to the surviving spouse. It's actually not that obvious. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. 
Oh, no. All right, just tell, tell me when they have 10 minutes left. Okay. Okay. Uh, and accompanying this focus on the different sorts of bequests is that we've got data, pretty detailed data coming from the HRF exit interviews on the, uh, about what these bequests look like when the first spouse dies. And finally, you know, as we were, as we were discussing at lunch today, you know, these are big, we're going to have a, have a model. It's a big sprawling model with a lot of bells and whistles. And we try really, really hard to get, get all these details right. And uh, we think we do a good job. Okay, a few facts. We're going to work with the head cohort of the HRS. It's, it's a cohort of people that in 1996 were 72 or older. We're only going to look at people that are fully retired. Uh, initially, of about 4,500 households, 1,400 are, are couples, and 3,200 are, are singles. And as I mentioned before, we're going to work a lot with the exit interviews. Uh, so when a member of a household dies, later on, the HRS will interview the survivors. And that allows us to look at estates, look at end-of-life expenditures, and also, when we're looking at these estates, how, the, how these resources are split between the spouse, the surviving spouse, and the other, heir, other heirs in the family. Okay. So these are sort of our, our trademark graph, uh, just tracking wealth of, of a particular cohort over time. We have split the uh, data up by permanent income. We'll discuss exactly how we construct this measure. It's a little different than we've done in the past. But these are permanent income tertiles. So this is the bottom third, middle third, top third, tracking households that are singles from the beginning to the end. And you see a little bit of a downward slope. All right. Here are current couples. So these are households that start off married, and we track them until one or both of the spouses die, okay? And a little harder to see the trend, but I, I would posit if you kind of draw a line through, you would see more of an upward slope, okay? All right, so what we do here is we identify couples that lose a spouse. And we track the evolution of what their wealth around the date when they lose that spouse. And so zero is the, the year of death, and we go to six years before and four years after. So we, we do a little bit of an event study. So the people who lose a spouse at this particular date, call them the treatment group, quite a treatment. And uh, we construct a control group, a group of people that are Otherwise, somewhere in terms of initial initial wealth, permanent income, age, et cetera, et cetera. Except the loss in their that household happened six to ten years after the after after the treatment household. So treatment and control groups are sensibly the same, except the loss of the spouse in the control household happens six to ten years later. Excuse me. Uh, uh, it's it's just I I don't think we 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 just uh, we have not let let's let's just say we have not empirically distinguished between whether it was whether it was preceded by an extended illness or not. Anyway, the. the Take the difference in wealth trajectories for these two groups. And what you see is over the 10 years surrounding a death, you see wealth dropping by about $160,000 after the death of the first spouse. Okay? Uh, you can do a similar exercise for medical spending. If you take the area under that, uh, under that curve, you'll get something in the neighborhood of $27,000. So obviously the wealth drop is a lot bigger 
than the, the increase in medical spending. One thing to note is at the same time, yes, yeah, it's treatment. So yeah, the drop when I say drop or drop or jump, it's really drop or jump relative to yeah. Uh, yeah although in the control group usually the profiles are fairly flat, so it's a, yeah. It does it doesn't matter that much. Anyway, okay. So we've got a hundred and sixty thousand dollar drop in wealth, uh, about 30,000 of that seems attributable to medical spending. What might explain the rest? One thing that, one thing that we've discovered is that when the, when the first spouse dies, transfers to non-spousal heirs average about $80,000. So that explains a lot of the gap. And again, I want to stress that the $70,000, I mean $80,000, that's not a residual. We're not calculating that as the difference between the first two numbers. That is something we're, me we're measuring for the exit interviews and the HRS. But the point is, it kind of fits into the gap. I don't know if I'd say nicely, but reasonably well. Uh, sure. Uh, we, we suspect that blended families may play a role in what's, what's going on here, although that's one, of many, that's one of the many possible dramas we haven't explored fully yet. But yeah, it's, there's no sense in which we're restricting it to sort of purely linear biological, whatever, biological families. Okay. All right, so um, here's just a little bit of summary information on that. So first, we split them up by permanent income tertile. Um, you can actually see about a third of uh, couples who, who, who lose a spouse are, are making what we're going to call these side bequests, by the way, okay, as opposed to terminal bequests when the last person dies. And you can see about a third of uh, households are... Uh, are making these sorts of bequests. Uh, when they make them, they're pretty significant. And uh, you can see around $200,000, $300,000, and they're a pretty significant share of the whole state. Again, mo most households are not making them at all, but you, you can see that. All right, you might think, well, how, do, how does the number of children deal with it? Well, people with children, without children are leaving it, I don't want to say too much more than that because it's very different, big differences in the size of wealth holdings of these groups. So it may just be that couples who never had children are richer, and that may be driving part of it. There may be other things going on as well. And home ownership status, and this is going to get into what Ami's going to talk about tomorrow, so be there. Um, uh, you can see that homeowners are more likely to make one of these side bequests. Yeah, as I said with Daniel, we suspect that probably matters. I, I'm i assuming as an empirical matter, we could dig that up in HRS. Yeah. You could, they really get into your business, as you know. And um, so I could probably look it up. We have it. Okay. It's going to be a long day. Okay, so um, here's our model. We have Couples and singles, they consume, save, leave bequests. They have warm glow bequest motives, as you might have guessed. They come in two flavors. There's going to be standard terminal bequests when the last member of the household dies. And there's going to be a, a, a bequest that we call side bequest, which is a utility that you get from leaving a bequest to someone besides the surviving spouse when the first spouse dies. Okay? 
So again, the idea is one spouse dies, part of the estate goes to the surviving spouse, part of it goes to non-spousal heirs, you're getting utility from that particular transfer. We call those side bequests. Okay, medical spending, uh, rich pay out of pocket, the poor are covered by Medicaid. And one thing that's really nice here about the spending model that we have is, since we're in this business right now talking about non-Markovian health costs, let's see, our medical spending process, medical spending accounts not only on uh, health in the current period, but health in the previous period, health in the previous wave. Okay, and that's pretty important because what the HRS asks people is, how much did you spend in the previous two years? And it's natural to think that that number depends on what, how, what your health was two years ago as well as today. Also, mechanically, by accounting for both of those, both of those measures of health, we can account for the, what happens when a member of the household dies. Or, or, or what? Yeah, funeral and stuff, yeah, it's a few thousand bucks, yeah. Okay. All right, health and longevity, the rich married and healthy live longer. And finally, we are going to do a lot of stratification on permanent income. We'll talk a little bit more about how we actually measure permanent income in a minute. Okay, preferences, standard CRRA. Notice that when you become a couple, you care about total utility. But you take household consumption and divide it according to an equivalent scale. Uh, warm globe bequest to non spousal heirs. They have the famous Donardi formulation. Uh, there's an intensity parameter phi, a shift parameter kappa. Um, there's J, and that again indicates the two flavors of bequests uh, the, the side bequest, where First cell size and we have the standard terminal bequest. Okay. All right. So this is pretty standard, at least certainly relative to what we've done before. Again, a big part is making sure we get the incidence of which couples become singles correct. Okay. Medical expenses have deterministic and stochastic components. We've been talking about sort of error components models. Our medical expense shocks have an error component form of an AR1 plus a white noise part. That's sort of our standard, uh, that's sort of a framework we've been using for a long time. And we condition on a lot of stuff, age, family structure, and health, and again, All right, and as I said before, this captures, this allows us to capture end of life spending, among other things. All right, value function for singles. Uh, just quickly, the states are, are your gender, the cash on hand, your health, your a measure of permanent income, and a persistent medical spending shock. And it's a generic Bellman equation. The only, only thing that's interesting is Probability S, you survive and continue. One minus S, you die and get utility from terminal bequests. Uh, budget constraints. Okay, these 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 are also pretty standard. This upsilon creature takes pre-tax income and converts it to post-tax income. We have means-tested transfers. Uh, you can see that there's out-of-pocket medical expenses being deducted here. All right, a little more interesting is what's going on with couples. So, all right, so you have a couple with some probability both members live and the couple continues as a couple next period. With some probability the uh, wife lives and the husband dies and you have what we call a new, a new widow. Some probability the, the, the reverse hap, converse happens, you have a new husband, and finally there is a non-zero chance that both of these people pass away over the same interval. 
both pass away, you have this terminal request. But what's interesting really is the new widowers or new wid widows or widowers. Okay. A new widower, this is the value of the estate right after the right after one spouse has died. There's been no distribution of wealth. What happens is that bequests are are basically that estate is split between the surviving spouse and not and your non-spousal, non-spousal heirs, and this is the utility you get from those side requests. That's how it's modeled. Okay. So again, it's not. It's not. It's, in some sense, it's. Some sense, it's not. It's. I guess it, it's whatever. It's uh, time consistency. Nominally, the surviving spouse makes the decision on how, how to split, how to split the estate. Okay. In terms of estimation, I think the only thing that's really exceptional, right, in terms of strategy, is what are we targeting in the method of simulated moments? Uh, we're tar targeting in the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles of wealth. We're distinguishing between co between singles and couples. We're splitting these up by PI tercile cohort and age. You know, basically a whole set of the profiles that we showed you before. All right, we're also targeting Medicaid recipiency rates. That helps us pin down the consumption floor. All right, in terms of first stage results, I think the one thing that's kind of interesting is how we measure permanent income. Okay, well, permanent income is some measure of lifetime earnings. And we we want this to be a measure that is invariant to a spousal death. It's sort of almost a, it's a measure of sort of lifetime resources. And if you think about it, right, if one spouse dies, lifetime earnings have a change. You just have one less spouse. Anyway, the way we do this is we start off by regressing annuitized income, annuitized income being a, a pension benefits and social security benefits. We regress that against some indicators for household structure and age. And our, our, our error term includes a household level fixed effect. Okay? And then we sort these fixed effects and your, each household's rank, each household's percentile rank of their fixed effect. That is our measure of permanent income. And again, that is just going to be an invariant household level fixed effect. It's not going to change if either of the spouses pass, pass away. All right, life expectancy. We know that people in good health will, will expect to live longer than people in bad health. Uh, women will typically live longer than men. Uh, people with high income will live longer than people with low income. Uh, other thing we find is that it, it's good to be married, okay? Married men live longer than single men. A lot of this you should know is because of composition. People with higher PI are more likely to be married. But still, you, you know, there's, there's whatever, a marital, a marital survival premium. Finally, conceptually, I want to point out this number here, which is the oldest survivor. And... What this measures in is, given a household that has at least one member, how long is it until the final member of the household dies? And 65% of the time, the, the oldest survivor is going to be a woman. 35% of the time, it might be a guy. And the point is, this oldest survivor is obviously going to be bigger than the typical life expectancy of uh, married women or married men. They expect, you know, they expect the lifespan of the oldest survivor is a little bit longer, and that's going to influence the household's decision-making process. And I would say if somehow you were to take a model of couples and convert it back to a model of singles, in some sense, that's the life expectancy target you may want to consider putting in your model. <coughs> huh, how am I doing? 
Okay. All right. Okay, parameter estimates, coefficient of relative risk aversion is 3.7. Uh, similar to what we've gotten in earlier exercises. Uh, the equivalent scale is 1.5. We are estimating this within the model to fit asset profiles, and especially capturing the transition from couples to singles, right? ADA is going to determine, it's going to determine, it's going to influence how much value a married household places on the utility of, of, it, of the surviving members. That said, we got a number of 1.5, which is kind of what you would get, say, in an OEC, similar to what you get in an OEC or other measures of equivalent scales. Consumption floor for singles about uh, about four thousand dollars. We fixed beta 0.97. We assume that the consumption floor for couples is 1.5. That for singles, that's pretty similar to what you actually see in program rules. All right, all right. There's that request function. Um, you got a lot of you are probably familiar that a lot of times felt that the best way to understand a bequest motive is not to look at the raw parameters, but to but to set up a hypothetical situation where a person has one year to live and ask how how will they split their resources between current consumption and bequests. And what we're finding is in terms of terminal bequests, it's around thirty thousand dollars. You can see that essentially for a single person, they don't leave any bequests till around thirty thousand dollars, and after that, they start leaving large amounts of their their wealth to bequests. And at the end of the day, when they have in the neighborhood of two two hundred thousand dollars of wealth, they're leaving over eighty percent of it. Um, Message I'd like you to take out is that um, you can do this for lots of estimates in the literature. I'm kind of proud to say we we kind of expand we we define the entire bounds. So um, and so this one lies right in the middle. Okay, so it's certainly in line with what what, what, what other people we and other people have gotten before. Model fit looks all right. Uh, there's there's lots more profiles which I won't show you. Now this is interesting. We do not directly target the, these sorts of um, event event transitions. This is not something we we directly target. Although we indirectly target because we're matching into, because we're matching single behavior and couples behavior, and you know there's a mix of those groups. But anyway, the point is. The model does a pretty good job of getting the average drop in wealth around the time of death, and does a pretty good job of getting the average increase in out-of-pocket spending around the time of death. Okay, so let's spend a little time talking about why retirees save. Um, we're gonna we're we're gonna we're gonna shut down various savings motives and see what happens. We'll set medical spending to zero and resolve the model. Then we'll eliminate bequest motives and resolve the model. Do both. And finally, we'll do an exercise where we eliminate where there's no weight on our surviving spouse. You know, it's a it's hypothetically it's a situation where you can imagine a couple just can't imagine life without the other. So they don't even plan for it. Okay. All right. In all of these cases, we're going to fix the age 74 distribution of state variables and utility parameters. This, of course, is important because if this were so changed that people knew throughout their lives, they would behave differently. And the assets they would bring into retirement would be different. All right, so here's eliminating medical expenses. So for singles, you see, so the dashed line is the baseline model. Solid line is the experiment, in this case being a model with no medical spending. See a little drop at the top 
a non-trivial drop in the middle and nothing happening at the bottom because basically there's nothing in terms of well for anything to happen to. Okay. In terms of couples, the effects are super small. Okay. All right, what about the quest motives? Remember, we have effectively, because I can't scroll back, we have effectively modeled the quest as a, as, as a luxury good. If you remember, there was a threshold. This is, yeah, this is probably a really bad idea. All right, I, all right, I managed to live tell about it. Uh, Anyway, remember, you go up to this point, there's no bequest. So if your household will flow wealth, you're just not leaving bequest, period. And bequest motives really don't enter into your thinking when you're making your savings decisions. Only then does it pick up. So, given that... It's perhaps not surprising that bequest motives really kick in just at the top. Okay, but they're pretty significant. At the, the at uh, singles at the top, PI tertile, and for couples at the top and in the middle. Okay, but what I what we really want to stress today is that eliminating both of these motives has huge effects, and in particular, the effects of eliminating the medical spending and bequest motives. That joint effect is way bigger than the sum of the two individual effects. We are still in the process of racking our brain about this. We're playing around with toy models, trying to get a nice, clean story. Here's my best understanding. I'll share with you with implicating my co-authors, which is that in any state, any state of the world, at the margin, only one of the motives is operative. There are certain states of the world where, at that point, your marginal utility of wealth is determined just by, just by bequests, and there are certain states of the world where your marginal utility of wealth is determined just by uh, medical spending. Okay? So what, ha so what happens here, so, so let's, let's do an example here. So think about, let's just think about this couple right here, all right? These are guys where on the margin, on their margin, their decisions would be determined by the value of requests. So if you eliminate medical expenses, that doesn't have much effect on their savings. It's not to say they, they, that doesn't make their saving more valuable, but, but the behavioral effects were inframarginal. Okay. Now, what they are being driven by is, is bequests, and you see it's a pretty significant drop. But the point is, it doesn't go down to zero because once you eliminate the bequests lurking around in the background, basically, you know, you know, playing around on social media because they never have anything to do, is going to be the uh, medical spending motive. And all of a sudden, when you eliminate the bequest motive, these medical spending motives start to become important. Okay? And so they keep assets from going to zero. And what you see is when, and so then when you eliminate both, neither region is present. And you see assets collapse. And then you're reverting back to, to so, a sort of, sort of quick exponential accumulation. Okay, so it's really, of you call it the interaction or the combination of these two, uh, uh, of these two motives that's really important in determining saving. You know, there's probably ways to say one is quantitatively larger than the other, but, but it's the combination of the two. You're saving, and you know, in some cases, that money will go to pay for your long-term care so you don't have a, have a Medicaid nursing home. But you also know, otherwise, it may go to a bequest. You know, that makes you happy as well. 
And if you eliminate one of these concerns, the other one is still present. Okay, it's only when you have no medical expenses and no concerns about heirs that, uh, that, that you get, get this rapid, rapid accumulation of wealth. All right, so I've got, what, five minutes? Okay. I am. All right, so let's, let, let, let's look at an aggregate. This is, this is not meant to be nationally representative. It's just simply an average over our simulated, simulated histories. Uh, wealth, 25th percentile is 50,000, 75th is 390,000. Uh, the mean is about the same level. Big right tail. Just keep that in mind. Uh, no medical expenses, the very bottom. Eliminating medical expenses is a big effect. Okay, at the 25th percentile. Non trivial effect at the medium, very little effect at the top. And because, because of the big white tail dominating the mean, it has uh, a, also an effect of about 3% of the mean. Okay. If we eliminate the quest motives, everything kind of works in reverse. At the mean, at the far right tail, where the quest motives are really dominating, uh, you see is eliminating the quest motives reduce saving by about 17%. It's about 8% at the 75th percentile. And all of a sudden, it becomes positive. So quickly, what's going on here? What's going on here is the side bequests. So what's happening here is, if you have no bequest motives, if you have no bequest motives, you may not be saving for bequests. But it does mean that if one member of a household dies, any, any estate that they did accumulate will go dollar for dollar to the surviving spouse. And the point is, these averages do not include the side bequests. Right? They're, they're young people. Uh, this, 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 is, this is like a community in, in Florida. Right? We only care about the old people. And so, once you eliminate the side bequests and the entire estate is going to the surviving spouse, you actually see at the bottom that assets go up a little. Okay? Uh, then there's the effect that when you put both of these, both put, remove both motives, you see about a 40% drop. It's kind of interesting that throughout much of the distribution, the effect is a very similar size. And I can't, I can't figure out myself whether that actually means anything, or it's just kind of how the numbers rolled out. Okay, no weight on the surviving spouse. Not surprisingly, that leads to a pretty big drop. Notice in particular at the very bottom, uh, it's very sweet. These uh, low-income older couples really just care about taking care of their, their, their significant other. And if they didn't, they wouldn't have any wealth at all. All right. Now, let's look at initial singles. Right, so this included couples and singles. This is just singles. Uh, it's going to look pretty similar. Again, big right tail. Again, medical expenses are more important at the bottom than at the top. The quest expense mode is bigger at the top than the bottom. Notice here the numbers are always negative because these are single, so there's, there's no room for these inside the quest games. But again, you put these two effects together, and they're really big. All right, so we have estimated a rich model of savings that we believe does a pretty good job of matching key aspects of the data, such as the fact that singles tend to accumulate wealth, albeit slowly as they age. Couples are actually more likely to accumulate wealth, and wealth drops significantly at the time of a spouse. Okay. From, from it, we learned that saving behavior and savings motives are very different across permanent income and couples and singles. For couples and people with high levels of permanent income, the quest motive seems to be more powerful. For singles and people with uh, lower permanent income, medical expenses seem more powerful. But the interaction of the two is really crucial. 
and the way these two effects play off of each other. And how when you squash one motive, another motive immediately pops in to take its place. All right, I'm, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to discuss this excellent paper. And because John did a great job in presenting the paper, I'm not going to spend a lot of time summarizing the paper. The key contribution of this paper is to extend the literature on late in life savings by studying the saving motives that are particularly important for couples. And to do this in their model, they incorporate the joint processes on income, mortality, and health among couples. And they show that the following motivations are important for couples. First, they save for the oldest survivor. The longevity risk they face is very different from what singles face because the oldest survivor tend to live much longer than the singles. And also the widow typically face significantly less income once their spouses pass away. So they have a strong motivation to build precautionary savings for the oldest survivor. And the couples also face different medical expenditure risk because on the one hand, they face different health transition probability than singles, but on the other hand, conditional on the same health state, the medical expenditure risk they face can be potentially different because, for example, the spouses can provide some care for long-term care. And lastly, the paper shows that the couples have stronger bequest motive than singles, and they capture this by allowing the couples to live have more, one more opportunity to leave bequest when the first death happens. And I think this is the most interesting aspect in the modeling. So today, my most comments will be about this, element, this aspect of modeling. And they didn't mention this in the presentation, but I think another important empirical contribution they have in the paper is to estimate the total medical spending risk that includes not only the out-of-pocket expenditures, but also the costs that are covered by the Medicaid. And because in the HRS ahead of data they are using for the main exercise, there is no information about the costs covered by the Medicaid. So they link, uh, they match the ahead sample to MCBS sample uh, to get these estimates. And I think these results are a valuable source for any researchers who work on the late in life medical expenditure risk. Now, going back to the bequest at the first death, uh, in terms of modeling, I think this is somewhere in between two extremes. One extreme is to allow for bequest when both of members die, and the other extreme is to allow for inter vivos every year. And they motivate this uh, modeling choice by showing the large asset change when the first death happens. Uh, and I'm fully convinced by the importance of this first bequest. But at the same time, I think it will be more interesting if there are some more discussions about the importance and the drivers of this first bequest. So for example, if we compare the size of this first bequest to you know, summation of the transfers or inter vivos that are made while both of members are alive, how do they compare? How much the first one is more important than the second one? And also during the presentation, there were some questions about, okay, what really drives this bequest at the first death, and I had a similar questions. I was wondering whether tax is one of the reasons for that. So if the assets were held under the name of the first one to die, maybe they want to utilize this step up in the tax basis calculation. So that can be one potential reason. And another potential reason could be that there is a downsizing uh, for the widowed, and they might use, want to use this money they got for, uh, by downsizing as a part of this first bequest. And I also want you to compare the two bequest utility functions they estimate, because when we look at the parameters that are estimated, these are for the singles and these are for the couples, they are very, very different, several orders of magnitude different. Uh, but we cannot compare these utility functions by just looking at the numbers. And the authors did one exercise in the paper that shows the fraction of the uh, wealth that are going to be bequ uh, bequeathed. Uh, but here I'm doing a different exercise that just shows the marginal utility from the bequest. And here the horizontal axis is the amount of bequest that covers from zero to one million dollars. Assuming that I didn't make a mistake here, uh, these two estimated utility functions look very different. And this is for the uh, couples with the surviving spouse and this is for the singles. And this one starts with a relatively high marginal utility and it decreases quite quickly. And the singles, it starts with a low level, it's almost flat. 
And in terms of the implied behavior, this can also be very different because the couple with the surviving spouse, they have a strong urge to leave some bequests to their children, but they are not going to leave a lot of bequests. And this makes perfect sense because they need to set aside some resources for the uh, surviving spouse. For the singles, this is more like you know, what is estimated in Lockwood. Uh, this is going to absorb all the residual uh, resources. And potentially, these, these two bequest utility functions may have very different interactions with the medical spending uh, risks as well. And another uh, implicit assumption made in this bequest modeling is that these two bequest functions are independent, which means that regardless of whether you left zero dollars or one million dollars at the first death, that does not affect my desire to you know, about how much bequest I want to leave in, in my second death. And whether this conceptually uh, makes sense or not, I guess it depends on whether this utility function captures warm glow or altruism. But after plotting the marginal utilities, I realized that uh, in any case, it doesn't matter that much because the marginal utility for singles is a flat. So even if we shift this by $1 million or something, it's not going to make any change in the results. So after seeing this, I realized that, okay, this is really innocuous assumption made in the paper. Uh, and the authors do the exercise to calculate the fraction of the wealth that can be attributed to the bequest uh, motif, but they don't do the exercise to calculate the fractions attributed to uh, separately to the first bequest and the second bequest. But I think this is a kind of straightforward exercise to learn. And also, we can learn some important things out of this exercise. So for example, the authors say the bequest motives are more important for couples. And this is because of two reasons. One, couples have two opportunities to leave a bequest. And the second is that bequests are luxury goods, and couples are, on average, wealthier. And one straightforward way to disentangle the relative importance of these two is just run the simulation by shutting off the motivation for the first bequest or bequest at the first death. And that's all I have about the bequest motive. And another comment that I have is uh, they, in calibrating the model, they match the Medicaid recipiency rate. And they do this by the income groups and not separately for singles versus couples. And the model parameter they are using to match this target is the effective consumption flow on the Medicaid. And because they don't separately target singles versus couples, there are two free, there are no two uh, free parameters. So they do this by assuming that the consumption flow for couples is 150% of that of the singles. But when we think about the Medicaid regulation, the singles and the couples, they face very different regulations in terms not only of you know, how much, whether you can keep your house or not, but also about how much resources you can keep in the form of the income and the financial wealth. So I was just wondering whether the fitness of the model can improve by you know, targeting singles and the couples separately for the Medicaid recipiency rate. And the last one is, you know, I was looking at some, some recent papers uh, on the late life savings, and there are some papers that use data from the Nordic countries, uh, including Iceland and Denmark. And one interesting thing about these countries is that the individuals or the older households in those countries face essentially no medical expenditure risk. And they also, even in these countries, they show that there is a significant uh, late in life savings after retirement. But of course, the motivation for savings are different across the different countries. And I have no doubt that medical expenditure risk is super important uh, driver in the US. I'm just bringing these papers to the discussion because I thought that this is another interesting way and a straightforward way to disentangle you know, the role of the different motivations for in explaining the late in life savings. That's basically what I have. Thank you.